in 1662 with Grant, the father of demography. Then 1798, there was Thomas Malthus, who did an essay on the principle of population. In 1805 was Alexander von Humboldt, and he was the first to recognize plant communities, at least listed by mail. We'll not get too many distractions like that. He was the first to describe ecological gradient of latitudinal biodiversity that increases towards the tropics. In 1844, we have Edward Forbes, who had the idea of community ecology. 1859, of course, Charles Darwin on the origin of species. 1866 brought in Ernst Haeckel, was the first to ever use the term ecology, and also re uh, popularized research links between ecology and evolution. Quite a hot topic at the time. In 1915, the Ecological Society of America was formed. 1925, Alfred Lotka discussed demography, nutrient cycling, and energy flow. In 1927, Charles Elton, an animal ecologist, emphasized population regulation, ecological niches, food, and food webs. In 1934, we have G. F. Gauss, who's uh, elaborated interspecific competition and predator-prey relationships, which we will speak about a little bit more later. 1953 was Eugene Odom, who did The Fundamentals of Ecology, which was the most influential ecology text at the time. In 1954, we have Andrew Wartha and Birch, who did The Distribution and Abundance of Animals. And then finally, 1970, was Robert MacArthur, was the co-founder on the theory of island biogeography and innovator of ecological statistical methods. We will be revisiting MacArthur as well. So, the scientific method within ecology is taking observations from natural history, suggesting hypotheses, using those hypotheses to make predictions, experiment to test the hypotheses, important in that is experimental design, which is a protocol for experiments and data collection, then there will be statistical te tests, which are used to construct models. Important within this is the concept of replication. It is the taking of repeated or replicated measurements. It's needed because of the inherent variability within most systems. The more variability there is, the more replicates are needed. Therefore, a measure of variability is, necess is necessary. 
So we have variant, the standard error, confidence intervals, etc. And it's also important to avoid pseudo replication. This is mismatching of scale. So, for example, if you had two pots set up with a hundred seeds in each, with one pot treated and the other a control, that would only be one replicate, not a hundred. It's not the number of seeds, but the number of replicates. Another important concept is that of bias, precision, and accuracy. In bias, we measure the closeness of a sample's expectation to the true population value. Precision is the closeness of each sample to the mean, and accuracy is the combined effect of bias and precision. Now we will discuss a few different sampling methods and the assumptions behind them. For random sampling, it is sampling so that all organisms have an equal and independent chance of being sampled. So it should be free from selection bias. So first, you would decide how many samples to take, so the number of replicates, and then secondly, you would choose the number of units randomly, so with a random number generator, for example. Systematic sampling is samples taken at regular intervals. This can be convenient as it gives even coverage, so for mapping variation across a study area, but it can have biases, so should be avoided. There's also cluster sampling. It's you have groups or clusters of samples taken at each of a number of random positions. So this is useful when moving between sites is difficult. You can have temporal clustering, so sampling during several periods on the same night. Sample units within a cluster are not independent, so the sample size should be the number of clusters. Another useful technique is adaptive cluster sampling. So you do your initial sampling at random, and then if you get your target organism, then you sample further within that vicinity. This is useful when organisms of interest are rare or patchy. A final method is stratified sampling. This would be dividing an area into two or more strata. This is useful when diversity varies across a site. The stratified regions are sampled randomly within each strata, but this then helps to minimize the variance within each strata. Another important method is mark recapture methods. So with your capture methods, you will assume that all individuals have an equal chance of being captured. So there would be variability in the likelihood of capture that would give a large bias in population estimates. So possible methods would be sweep nets, dip nets. Sweep nets would be used in for catching butterflies, dip nets for catching waterborne invertebrates. 
hand capture for sessile organisms, live traps for larger mammals, snap traps as well, and mist nets for kind of butterfly type things again. Now, next important is when you're marking methods within the marking recapture should allow individual animals to be identified when they are caught. And it does carry the assumption that marks are not lost from one capture to the next, and that marking does not affect behavior or mortality. And then for this, you have an equation, which is big M over big big M over big N equals little m over little n. And so M, big M, is the number of animals captured the first time. Little m is the number of individuals that were marked the second time. And then N is the total number of Little n is the total number of individuals captured the second time. And then you can solve for your big N, which would be a total population size. And obviously, the more replicates you do with that, the more precise that estimate will be. Now moving on to experimental study. In experimental study, researchers assign treatments to units or subjects so that differences in response can be compared. For example, clinical trials, factorial experiments on comp uh, compatriation, competition should be, and predation. In order to have an experimental study, you must have at least two treatments. The experimenter assigns the treatments to the subjects. The advantage is the random assignment of treatments to experimental units. Random assignment minimizes the influence of confounding variables, allowing the experimenter to isolate the effect of the treatment variable. This roughly equalizes confounding variables as it would be spread across the two groups. An observational study, on the other hand, nature does the assigning of treatments to subjects. The researcher has no influence over which subjects receive which treatments. You cannot distinguish between two reasons behind an association between an explanatory and response variable within an observational study. For example, when climbing Everest, our climbers have higher survivability because they have oxygen with them or because oxygen is a sign of greater preparedness. You can't tease that out in an observational study. A clinical trial is an experimental study in which two or more treatments are assigned to human subjects. When on non-human subjects, these are called laboratory experiments or field experiments, depending on where they take place. In order to reduce bias, you should have a simultaneous control group. So the study includes both the treatment of interest and a control group. You should have randomization, so treatment randomly assigned to sampling units, and blinding and this is within clinical trials only, where neither the subject nor the clinician knows which units are assigned to which treatment. 
To reduce the effect of sampling error, experiments include replication, so the study would be carried out on multiple independent sampling units. It should be balanced, the number of sampling units nearly equal across groups, and blocking sampling units grouped together according to, for example, location or gender yielding multiple repetitions of the same experiment in multiple settings. Now, obviously, a key part of this is randomization. Randomization breaks the association between possible confounding variables and the explanatory variable, allowing causal relationships between explanatory and response variables to be assessed. Randomization does not eliminate variation contributed by confounding variables, only their correlation with the treatment. It ensures that variation from confounding variables is similar between groups. Randomization should always be carried out using a random process, such as using a computer to provide each individual a random number, A to those with the lowest number, B to those with the highest number. Other ways of assigning treatments to subjects are almost always inferior, because they do not eliminate effects of confounding variables haphazard assignment, where the researcher tries to be random, has been shown to be non-random and biased. And to revisit replication. Replication represents not the number of plants or animals used, but the number of independent units in an experiment. An experimental unit can be made up of a batch of organisms treated as a group, for example a field plot, a cage of animals, a household, or a petri dish. Multiple individuals belonging to the same unit should be considered together as a single replicate. Pseudo-replication is treating a single organism as a replicate when the chamber or the field plot is the experimental unit. There are three types of pseudo-replication. First is simple. This is where repeated measurements are taken from one experimental unit. An example would be two plots. One was burnt, one was unburnt, and then two take six different quadrats from within each plot. The true experimental unit is the plot, not the six quadrats. There's also sacrificial pseudo-replication, where you do have true replicates, but then they are pooled prior to analysis. There is also temporal pseudo-replication, where repeated measurements are taken on a single experimental unit over time. Now, a more extensive discussion on blocking. Blocking is the grouping of experimental units that have similar properties. Treatments are assigned randomly to units within each block. Differences between treatments are only evaluated within blocks, so the variation arising from differences between blocks is considered separately. Relating to blocking is a paired design. Measurements in plot halves are not independent, so you analyze the data differently. Paired design is more powerful, 
as it controls for a lot of extraneous variation between sampling units that can obscure the effect we are most interested in. We have a little picture to show what our blogging looks like. Now on to a discussion about observational studies and how to best set them up. When you are doing an observational study, you want to incorporate as many features of good experimental design as possible to minimize bias, such as simultaneous controls and blinding. And you also want to impact sampling error. So using replication, balance, and blocking. Strategies to limit the effect of confounding variables on a difference between treatments in a controlled observational study would be matching or adjusting for known confounding variables. Now let's move on to discuss life history traits. Life history is the timing and magnitude of growth reproduction, and mortality over an individual's life. This includes age and size at maturity, lifespan and aging, size and age relationship, the size and number of offspring. This reflects solutions to problems posed by past environments, and allocation of resources. The components of a life history are the size of organisms, reproductive characteristics, reproductive allocation or effort, rate of growth and development, parental care, and longevity. Greater investment in one trait is at the expense or reduced investment in others. So, some examples. Excuse me. Of reproductive characteristics would be the timing of breeding. So you may find predictable breeding compared to unpredictable breeding, depending on whether it's a predictable or unpredictable environment. There's the timing of first reproduction, so precocious reproduction versus late maturing. Species that live the longest tend to delay the longest. The loss of early opportunity is offset by more successful opportunity later. And we also have frequency of reproduction, single versus multiple events. There is similarity, a single reproductive event in a lifetime, or idioparity, which would mean repeated reproductive events, which spreads the risk of loss of reproduction to multiple events. Offspring size have the option for large versus small, and it has been shown that larger size have higher survivorship. And you can also look at clutch size, which is many or few in each reproductive event. Now with life histories, we do see a gradient from K to R selected populations. K selected species, the best reproductive strategy is to invest more energy on maintenance and growth. Some examples are giant eucalypts, whales, albatrosses, koalas, marine turtles. Habitat is constant or predictably seasonal. The population is relatively crowded and constant in size. Regulation is related to density. 
there are fewer opportunities for the establishment of a young. There's delayed maturity, high parental investment, little environmental fluctuation, intense competition between adults, long life, slow development, generally idioparous, and they have low reproductive rates. For our selected species, the best reproductive strategy is to invest more energy on reproduction and less on growth and maintenance. For example, weeds, flies, small mammals, and fish. These are good in habitats that are highly irregular and unpredictable, with conditions that are favorable only briefly or irregularly, individuals selected that can reproduce rapidly, they have a rapid maturity, quick development, low parental investment, short-lived, and generally semiparous. Now a look at demography. In demography we study life history tables, which is a tabulation of mortality of population or cohort, with respect to age, divides population into age classes, each of which has an age-specific mortality risk. A cohort follows the fate of individuals in a cohort from birth until the last individual dies. They should be born at approximately the same time. They can be useful for humans who are traceable and short-lived plants. There is also a static age specific, so you can examine the age structure of the population at one particular time, take a sample of the population, and divide into age classes. This is useful for long-lived plants and animals which are mobile or cryptic. To construct a life table, you would have x, which is your age interval, a sub x is the number of survivors at age x, l sub x is the proportion of the original core heart surviving to the start of the age interval. D sub x is the proportion of surviving individuals that die during interval x. Q x is the rate of mortality during interval x. K x is the killing power, a measure of the intensity. Now doing static, you have age at death tables, so determine the age at death of individuals. This assumes that population size is stable over time, and birth and death rates are constant. You can also do a population age structure. Determine how many individuals at each age class are living and this assumes a same age distribution over time. Another aspect is the survivorship curve. We have type 1, which is like this, and that covers vertebrates with high parental care, such as humans. You have type 2, which is birds, bacteria, and other small organisms, and type 3, which is many plants, insects, and other organisms with high fecundity. For a fertility schedule, we have either the total number of individuals produced in one generation divided by the original number of individuals, or the sum of the number produced per original individual 
in each stage. If R0 equals zero, the population is replacing itself exactly. If R0 is less than one, then the population is not replacing itself. Another important concept is the intrinsic capacity for increase. This depends on an organism's fertility, longevity, and speed of development. R equals the net reproductive rate as a function of mean length of generation. We have a stable age distribution. This would be a population growing rapidly with constant fertility and mortality rates. Or you can have a stationary age distribution. This is a population at a constant size constant and equal age-specific mortality and fertility rates. Now to discuss dispersal. Dispersal is the movement of individuals away from the home site or birthplace into a new habitat or area to survive or reproduce. This can be passive or active, results in gene flow, and affects the distribution of organisms. In animals, often what happens in young, called natal dispersal. In plants, pollen and seeds or spores are the units of dispersal. Now we may wonder, why should we disperse? Well, the first is that it changes the size and composition of populations. And number two, you maximize your chances of finding and colonizing vacant areas. There are hazards to dispersal as well. You have increased exposure to physical and biological hazards during movement, and the possibility of finding only suboptimal habitat or survival and reproduction are reduced. Now there are adaptations to dispersal. You have plant spores, which are resistant to desiccation. They're numerous, dormant for extended periods, and have passive dispersal. For marine invertebrates, they have numerous hang eggs, which hatch and enter the ocean as larvae. They grow and develop. And as they do that, that's passive dispersal. There's also small aquatic invertebrates in arid areas. They have drought-resistant eggs, which sink into the mud and then stick to the feet of wading birds and are dispersed. Many insects, they have larval stages in water, often very short stages, and then the adult stages are winged. Something important to remember about dispersal is that most dispersing organisms die. It's a trade-off between staying home and having fewer descendants, or disperse, and having a chance to colonize a new habitat. Now there are different types of dispersal as well. There is diffusion, which is the gradual movement of a population across suitable terrain for several generations. We also have jump dispersal, which is the movement of organisms across large distances in a single lifetime, such as island colonization. There's also secular dispersal, where species undergo changes over geologic time, and new species arise after dispersal. In plant dispersal, 
You have water, wind, animals, valakori, and gravity. And in animals, you can have natal based dispersal post weaning, or we also see sex based dispersal. Now, there are barriers to dispersal there's mountains, deserts, ocean, water. Temperature, predation, salinity, geology, food, etc. On a local scale, most species have evolved very good dispersal mechanisms. On the continental scale, some species are better adapted for dispersing across barriers, while others are not. Humans have increased the dispersal on the continental scale. There is the rule of tens for alien species, which says one in ten new species will become established, and then one in ten of established species will become a pest. Now, an important law to understand what species may establish is Shelford's Law of Toler Tolerance, which states the distribution of a species will be controlled by that environmental factor or factors for which the organism has the narrowest range of tolerance. Now, there are tactics to avoid lethal environmental conditions. We have hibernation, animals during cold months of the year when food is limited. There is dormancy and resistance, particularly plants to hot, cold or hot temperatures. There is diapause, insects and or bats may enter a cold, tolerant diapause. And there's migration. Animals from poor environmental conditions move to suitable conditions. This is important for genetic health, maintaining health, and fitness, aka following food. A key mechanism within ecology is predation which is where members of one species eat those of another, killing prey. There are herbivores who prey on green plants, seeds, and fruit, carnivores who prey on herbivores or other carnivores, parasitoids who lay eggs on or near the host, which is subsequently killed or eaten. There's parasites who live on or in their hosts. Cannibalism, where predator and prey are members of the same species. The impact of predation may restrict the abundance and distribution of a population. Is a process, along with competition, around which communities are organized, such as an apex predator, is a major selective force. Adaptations, for example, warning colorations in frogs and butterflies, are significant, as is predator-prey co-evolution. Now we're going to look at a couple models of predator-prey relations, which you can see right here. This is the Rosenweg MacArthur model. You can see the isocline there. And then this is the Lotka Volterra model. It's one that goes up and down, and if you take time out of it, Actually ends up going in kind of this ellipse shape. The dominant limitation on prey is the predators. As the prey numbers build up, 
temporarily limit their own rate of increase due to competition to resources, diseases, etc. Predation limitation becomes less and less important. Now, I'm going to discuss ecological scale. So, in particular with Acacia myrtifolia, we have a variety of ways that you can assess the distribution of this organism. You can say it is only found in Australia, or temperate regions, or recently burnt areas. The process for why it would only be found in Australia would be evolution or continental dynamics. The process for why it would be found in temperate regions would be climate or water requirements and temperature tolerance. And the process for why it would be found only in recently burnt areas would be germination requirements and competitive interactions. For being found in Australia, the temporal scale would be 10 to the 6 years. The spatial scale would be 10 to the 5 kilometers. For the pattern being found in temperate regions, the temporal scale would be 10 to the 3 years, and the spatial scale would be 10 to the 3 kilometers. For recently burnt areas, the temporal scale would be 10 years, and the spatial scale would be 10 kilometers. Now looking at species distributions, there are two different schools of thought on how they can be distributed. There's the European school, which uses a binomial name for communities. That name should indicate what species are present. The assumption is that species have similar minimum and maximums within the environmental gradient, and all flourish in the same area. Ecotones are areas where these species overlap with the next community. For the American school, the assumption is that each species has their own individual minimums and maximums within the environmental gradient. Communities will not always have the same composition. Now to understand diversity. Diversity is composed of two factors, richness and evenness. Richness is the number of species. Evenness is the relative distribution of abundances. More even distribution means better species diversity. For example, if you have two communities of five species, if one has 80 of one species and 20 of the rest, that is not the most diverse. If the other has 20 of each of the five species, that is much better diversity. Now let us discuss succession. There are two types of succession. Primary succession occurs on a new substrate, such as a dune, a lava flow, or an area exposed by a receding glacier. The substrate is unfavorable, needs soil formation. It has the absence of accumulated propagules requires species that disperse easily and tolerate harsh conditions. In secondary succession, this occurs after a catastrophic disturbance, such as a tornado, agriculture, or fire. The substrate is more conducive to plant growth, 
and propagules are still present as a seed bank. Now there are three theories on succession that we need to know. The first is Clement's succession, formulated in the 1920s, and it's called the superorganismic view. His view postulated that succession is a predetermined process with well-defined stages, completely driven by living organisms through changes they induce in the environment. This leads to a fixed end stage or climax. In the pioneer stages, changes make the environment unfavorable for primary pioneer species but favorable for other species. Species from later seral stages then invade, repeat the process, until climax is reached of a final stable community in the end of succession. This model fits best for primary succe succession in harsh environments and the method of facilitation, which we'll get into later. Gleason succession. His theory came in 1926, and his view is the individualistic nature of succession. He postulated that replacement is a species-by-species -species process, with chance events being very important. Different colonizing abilities determine changes. And a quote from Gleason. An association is not an organism, even a vegetational unit, but merely a coincidence. Gleason's method holds up best in forest dynamics in a tolerance setting. And then we have Egler in 1926, not sure if that year's right, and his was the initial floristic competition, composition, which states that most species are present from the beginning, and the final composition is determined by random differences in early succession, that a succession occurs as various species occupy the canopy. And this is a good model for post-fire recovery. So now we're going to discuss the three types of succession that have been postulated. These were postulated by Connell and Slater. First is facilitation. This would mean that pioneer species drive community dynamics. Early species modify the environment and make it favorable to other species. This is mainly in harsh environments, such as in primary succession. There is also tolerance. Pioneer species have no effect on community dynamics. Changes produced by pioneer species have little or no effect on other species which tolerate these conditions. Changes are unaffected by pioneers. Changes in species competition reflect different dispersal abilities. And this is most often seen in forest dynamics. This is also inhibition, where pioneer species prevent changes. The pioneer species produce changes that favor themselves and prevent the establishment of other species. Early invaders exclude further invasions. Succession occurs when something damages early colonizers. This happens in some terrestrial systems, such as South Australian grasslands, but mainly marine systems. Now to discuss disturbances. There are three main characters that describe a disturbance. The magnitude, the distribution, and timing. Magnitude can be described by the intensity 
and severity. Intensity being the physical force of the event, and severity being the impact on individuals or communities. The distribution of a disturbance can be described by the extent or spatial distribution. The extent would be the size of the system affected, while spatial distribution would be the shape and relationship to topography. Timing of disturbances can be described by frequency and predictability. Frequency would be the mean number of events per unit time, and subheadings would be return interval and rotation time. The return interval is the time between disturbances. Rotation time is the time required for the studied area to be subjected to disturbances in every quadrant. For predictability, this is the scaled inverse function of the variance of the return interval. After a disturbance, K strategist displace R strategist and the diversity is highest when R and K strategists are both present. Competitive exclusion can be interrupted by disturbances and allow R and K species to coexist. If the disturbances are too frequent, K species will never establish. Competitive exclusion is faster in more productive environments. Diversity is always higher in low to intermediately productive systems. Small-scale disturbances can maintain diversity on a larger scale. They create spatial heterogeneity, whereby having areas in different successional stages. For example, patches with different time since fire. Gaps in the forest of different age since forest collapse. When there is a small disturbance, if it creates a small gap, then it would be filled in with growth of individuals around the edge of that gap. When it's a large gap, it would be filled by species of dispersers. Another key concept is competition. There are two definitions of competition. We have competition sensu stricto and competition sensu lato. Competition sensu stricto means the reduction in reproduction, growth, or survivorship from reduced availability of a limiting resource produced by the consumption of the resource by other organisms. Competitor is using the same resource and this uses the mechanism of consumption. While consp competition sensulato is just the reduction in reproduction, growth, or survivorship produced by the presence of other organisms and covers a few more areas. We do still have consumption, where resources are taken more rapidly by one organism, making the other organism resource limited, but we also include preemption, where resources are taken by one organism before the other is present, leaving a depleted environment. There's also overgrowth, where one organism grows on top of another, preventing the latter from acquiring resources. There's also encounter competition, where the presence of an organism affects the behavior of the other, reducing its ability to acquire resources. The competitive outcome 
is generally environmentally dependent. An example of this would be gallium saxatile versus gallium sylvatica, where these two species can be found together. Gallium saxatile will be found in more acidic soils, and gallium, gallium sylvatica will be found in more calcareous soils. This can create patches where acidic soils would have all of the gallium saxatile, and gallium sylvatica would have be in all the calcareous soils. There can be a mixture to keep that heterogeneous, though, and this is called the rescue effect, when there is dispersal between patches so that the competitive exclusion is prevented if they are connected enough. Now to understand what drives community and trophic structure. One example is a keystone predator. This is a predator species that controls the community structure through a modest, small, direct effect. One example is Pisaster, which is a starfish that prevents the competitive exclusion of sessile intertidal organisms, such as limpets, barnacles, and mussels. When the disaster is removed, the number of species is decreased from between 15 to 20 down to under 5 species. Now we do see different communities that are driven by either top-down or bottom-up processes. When a community is driven by top-down control, then a predator removal changes the rest of the community, and resource addition at the bottom trophic level has no effect. When we have bottom-up control, predator removal has no effect, and resource addition changes the rest of the community. Now within trophic levels, we will tend to see up to four trophic levels, and within each level there will be a different mechanism determining which is determining the abundance of that level within the system. For example, in a system with four trophic levels, the abundance of your secondary carnivores will be determined by bottom-up processes or between by competition between carnivores. For your primary carnivores within the system, their abundance will be controlled by top-down processes or predation. For your herbivores within this system, they will be controlled by bottom-up processes or by competition. And your producers in the system will be controlled by top-down processes or predation. Always at the top of your cascade is going to be a bottom-up process and competition. And so we have bottom-up, top-down, bottom-up for a three-trophic level, bottom-up, and then top-down for a two-trophic level, and obviously just a bottom-up or competition is the determining factor in a single trophic level. Now an example of the trophic levels is the Great Salt Lake, which actually shifts between two and three trophic levels depending on the situation. 
it has high rainfall, which will then reduce salinity. This can also be snow melts coming down from the mountains. When salinity is decreased, then the corixid predator settles within the system, and algae biomass increases. That's because you have it moving into a three-level system. When you have the top predators, the predator abundance is controlled by bottom-up processes or competition among individuals. Your herbivores are controlled by top-down processes or the number of your predators. And then your producers, your algae, are controlled by bottom-up processes or interspecies or intraspecific competition. When it has higher salinity, you see the disappearance of your predators, and so it turns into a two-trophic level system. And so your producers are, or your algae, are controlled by predation or top-down processes, while your herbivores are then controlled by bottom-up processes or competition. Now, I'm going to look at island biogeography. In island biogeography, we see two different patterns depending on whether we have a continental area or an island. With an island, we see a lower intercept but a steeper slope, and with a continental, we see a higher intercept with a shallower slope. Then, we'll also look and describe this graph as well. This graph is very important. You can see these pink lines go together, and these orange lines go together. In extinction curves vary with island size. The chance of any given species going extinct increases with the number of species present. Smaller populations in small islands are more likely to go extinct. Immigration curves vary with island size, distance to mainland. Chances of immigration are higher for islands that are closer to the mainland and larger islands. Chances of a new species arriving declines with the number of species present. So, again, the most important part is this graph. So if we have a large island, which is near the mainland, then our immigration rate will start off high and go down to low. And then, as if it's a small island far away, it'll start off lower and continue down. For our extinctions, we see a small island far away, and we're going to have a greater likelihood of extinctions than we would on a large island. Now, another very important concept is that of spatial heterogeneity. More complex structure of cactus provides for more species of insects, and this is because more heterogeneity in spatial area is a contributor for diversity. Now, we'd like to look at this figure, which is describing rainforest diversity. The, there is a theory that interglacial fragmentation is part of what has produced the 
imply diversity that we see within rainforest systems today. So the belief is that you would have had one large rainforest to begin, and then when glaciers came in, the rainforest patches that were left would have been fragmented. Within each fragment, you would see allopatric speciation going on. So then, when the glaciers receded, those would rejoin together, but there would already be speciation present. So fragmentation can be a method of increasing diversity over geologic time. Another important concept is that of species packaging, which is illustrated well in this image here. What we see is that the higher productive, more productive a system is, the narrower the band of resources that could be required for a viable population. And so you can get a narrower range within a species. So a more productive system has a higher capacity for the number of species that it can carry. Now to discuss species diversity and ecological processes. Tillman had a study which showed that high diversity plots were covered more quickly after drought. They also had nutrient acquisition, so there is, it is questionable whether that data is applicable. There was another experiment done, and it confirmed this again. But there's still the query on whether this is a started statistical artifact. The higher the diversity, the greater likelihood that the most productive species will be in the plot, rather than that it's actually a more productive system. So what do we actually know? We know that several ecosystem functions increase with the number of species, and that there is a weak niche complementary effect. What's most important is a diversity of functional groups rather the number of species. We're going to look more into our marine systems and the impact of development with particular reference to its impact on hydrology, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Land clearance and agriculture increase the export of nutrients from land to water. In tropical Queensland, 50% forest cover is critical to keep phosphorus export minimized. Phosphorus export increases as deforestation increases. A similar study was conducted in WA, but from the opposite perspective. It showed that the percentage of agriculture in the system and phosphorus export are correlated. It showed that when phosphorus export reaches a critical level, when agriculture reaches 50%. We also see that more runoff increases the net export of nitrogen and phosphorus. Dissolved inorganic phosphorus or dissolved inorganic nitrogen, DIP or DIN, are the greatest indicators of algal blooms, as these are the most bioavailable. Particulate forms are less available. As total nitrogen increases, the form of nitrogen changes from predominantly dissolved organic nitrogen to predominantly dissolved inorganic nitrogen. Now, lakes can be used as indicators 
for their hydrology, land use, and climate. They act as a reaction chamber and combine lots of factors. Key in hydrology is in the lake is mixing residence time of water within the lake, nutrient input, and the littoral zone. Land use also has impacts on the lake, shading, shelter, and organic input. For climate, there is impact of rainfall events and temperature on the lake ecosystem. Carbon is a key component of water quality. A small increase in dissolved organic carbon leads to improved water quality, while large amounts of dissolved organic carbon cause problems. Labile, DOC, acts as a substrate for microbes. Recalcitrant DOC is less available for microbes. Nitrogen may limit or enhance algal growth. The greater uptake of NH4 and NO3 when DOC is added decreases nitrification and conversion of NO4 and into NO3, which has downstream losses of DIN decreased. DOC can increase the biological oxygen demand, resulting in deoxygenation of the water, which can cause fish kills, algal blooms, and um, H2S. In the River Torrens, high levels of DOC are coming from urban vegetation. The DOC is greatest for poplar and the river red gum, but when this is accounted for on biological oxygen demand, these actually show the least impact. Now we're going to look at how to formulate a food web. There are two main nutrients that we use in determining a food web, particularly when using isotopes. We have carbon. We can use carbon-13 and carbon-12. The ratio can be shown as it is maintained up the higher trophic levels, so it shows who is eating who. The stable isotopes of 15N and 14N accumulate, so as you go up in trophic levels, it is enriched, which shows you the trophic position of each organism. Now, I'm going to show you these little diagrams showing This is a very high saline system, which has been impacted by low flows in the River Murray. You can see that we have very high, low numbers of species and very low diversity. So this food web would be very impacted by extinction or reduced numbers in any one of these species. However, further up the river, within the Murray Estuary, you can see we have highly abundant and complex structures, as all of these species have multiple interactions across the trophic levels. These are very important for maintaining the diversity of the system. Now we'll discuss ecological stoichiometry. Ecological stoichiometry is the balance of multiple chemical substances in ecological interactions and processes. In short, that is, traces changes in the body of the carbon, 
to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Homeostasis results in narrowing variation in chemical content in an organism compared to the resources it consumes. The red field ratio for plankton is 106 carbon to 16 nitrogen to 1 phosphorus. That's by number of atoms, and that is quite similar to water. A mismatch between stoichiometric, oops, stoichiometric ratios between food and herbivore may significantly impact upon growth. Herbivores will be opportunistic to take advantage of a food ratio that best equates with its stoichiometry. Mismatches drive excretion of carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus. An example of this would be a nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of 1 to 1. In this situation, excretion would be N limited, and the copepods would predominate. If we have a, however, N to P ratio of 15 to 1, then excretion would be phosphorus limited, and the cladocherons would predominate. In a normal ratio, excretion is optimal. That would be 7 to 1 of N to P. And you would either see cladocherons uh, or copepods. Now, on to phytoplankton photosynthesis. Phytoplankton are eukaryotic algae and cyanobacteria. They're autotrophic and generally microscopic. Growth for phytoplankton can be limited by light, increases growth to a level where it saturates, but then at high levels it levels out and can even start photoinhibition, degrading proteins responsible for photosynthesis and impairing growth. Nutrients can also limit growth. Growth will scale to a point and then decreases past saturation. Temperature can be another limiting factor. Growth scales to a point, then decreases after a point as proteins denature. Photosynthesis will continue when nitrogen is limited, but will be stored as a starch to be used when nitrogen is available again. And we do have some graphs showing some of these features. Now, on to phytoplankton movement within the water column. Phytoplankton density is greater than the bathing medium, and so phytoplankton have various things they need to do with this. There are three main strategies. Mixing, swimming, or floating. For those that mix, they rely upon water movement to remain in suspension and entrainment. This restricts growth in time and space, and predominantly diatoms use this. For those that swim, they rely on active movement, such as a flagella. This requires energy and is not efficient in highly turbulent water. We see this with dinoflagellates and volvox. For floating, these rely on buoyancy regulation and is particularly common in cyanobacteria. Most effective under still conditions, but reduces losses under all conditions. Now, a very important law, which we will repeat twice, is Stokes law, and that is that the terminal sinking velocity is a function of the radius of a particle, the excess density, and the viscosity 
of the fluid. So again, Stokes' law states that the terminal sinking velocity is a function of the radius of a particle, the excess density, and the viscosity of the fluid. There are a few things that in can increase sinking velocity, such as cell size, shape, colony formation, and filaments. Live cells have vital attributes which modify intrinsic sinking velocity. For example, lipid, carbohydrate, and protein accumulation, as in most algae, or buoyancy regulation via gas vesicles and carbohydrate ballast in cyanobacteria. Now once again, we'll discuss the Redfield Ratio. The Redfield Ratio is the Plankton Ratio of 106 to 16 to 1 for carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen to phosphorus, which is similar to water. In N-limited waters, we see the ratio decrease from to 12 to 1 carbon to nitrogen. In N-sufficient, we see 16 to 1 carbon to nitrogen. If there's higher light, nitrogen, or phosphorus limitation, you need less chlorophyll for carbon to chlorophyll ratio to do the work of photosynthesis. If there is a nitrogen limitation, the carbon to nitrogen ratio goes up. If there's phosphorus limitation, the carbon to phosphorus ratio goes up. Now to discuss cyan <coughs> cyanobacteria buoyancy regulation. This allows for entry and exit from the euphotic zone. Entry and exit from the hypolimnion as well allows access to deep water nutrients and increases the probability of light interception. Now we're going to discuss four species of cyanobacteria and what methods they use. We have Synecococcus, which has no gas vesicles, relies solely upon the accumulation of photosynthesis products, which then weigh it down, taking it to the bottom of the water column, where it can respire, losing those products and taking up nutrients, which then provide more buoyancy. We have Plankothrix, which has a small number of gas vesicles. There's Anabina, which has oscillation in size of gas vesicles to mediate movement through the water column. There's also Microcystis, Microcystis, which has a static number of highly turgid gas vesicles and depends on accumulation of products of photosynthesis to regulate movement down the water column. There can be a short-term response to light, which would be carbohydrate accumulation, which is nested within a longer-term response to historical light and nutrient climate, which is the storage products and gas vesicle volume. Now to discuss the biological pump. The biological pump is marine plants taking up CO2. They transfer organic matter to depth. It's a pathway for rapid carbon sequestration. Primary productivity is controlled by light, temperature, mixing, major nutrients, grazing, and micronutrients. For the solubility pump, cold water has higher CO2 solubility. Gas exchange allows CO2 to enter the ocean. Iron has been implicated as limiting nutrient. 
in high nutrient, low chlorophyll systems. The natural source of iron in the oceans is iron-rich dust. Pat's climate data shows that there's a correlation to high iron levels with low CO2 and lower temperature levels. Studies have shown that increased iron increases chlorophyll production, but the corollary is that carbon sequestration is not necessarily reduced as a biological pump can have low efficiency. There are potential issues as well, such as oxygen depletion, ecological shifts to harmful algae, the production of other greenhouse gases, disruptions or changes in higher trophic levels, and there are many unknowns, and it is necessarily changing the ecology of the system with unknown consequences. Now our final discussion will be on controlling cyanobacteria through flow. Algal blooms have been established to occur during the summer when there are low river discharges. Within the river torments, it's been shown that anabina will predominate when there is discharge of less than a thousand megaliters per day. Alakasyra occurs at greater than a thousand megaliters per day. Anabina grows at a rate of 0.37 per day, and Alakasyra sinks at a rate of 0.95 meters per day. Water mixing at least diurnally limits the growth of anabina via maintaining minimum discharge and pulsing discharge. The important structural features within flow is the diurnal surface layer at the top, the di diurnal thermocline. Right below the diurnal thermocline is the metalimnion. Right between the metalimnion and the hypolimnion is the seasonal thermocline, and at the bottom we have the hypolimnion. So again, that's the diurnal surface layer, then the diurnal therm thermocline, then the metalimnion, and finally the hypolimnion, with the seasonal thermocline between the metalimnion and the hypolimnion. And so those are the features of flow as relates to cyanobacteria. You are very well prepared and I am sure will do amazingly on your exam. Good job. Thanks for watching this video.